We are all going to die. There's no way of getting out of it. But take a step back. As they say, use your time wisely. Now, I'm not going to divulge too much into this. When it comes down to it, the key is living in the moment. Strong interests and abilities in history, writing, and government studies. So it will be interesting to see what he decides to choose. His Greenstone topic tonight does have some of that background to it. It's called Texts, Tweets, and Global Turmoil, How Small Screens Are Shaping Our World. Please welcome Kyle. Hi, I'm Kyle Wilson, and before we get started, would anybody like to see a cat video? That was heartwarming. <laughs> but gosh, us humans of the 21st century can be so strange. Worshipping cats on the internet, photographing our food with smartphones, and watching spray tan women from New Jersey argue at dinner parties. I guess that's just our thing now, doing silly, pointless things on different size screens throughout the day. I should know, I'm a teenager. But what I didn't know before is how, on the contrary, these devices in our offices, living rooms, and back pockets actually impact us in a lot more important ways. When we can talk face to face with somebody on the other side of the planet, our world gets smaller. But when our world gets too small, things tend to get a little cramped. People begin to figuratively bump into and jostle one another in ways that literally translate to civil unrest, things like violent revolution and civil war. So, in my presentation, it is my goal to show you that communication is our biggest ally in our global power struggle, as well as our biggest obstacle obstructing us from social progress. So to view the implications of our modern devices, let's go back to the year 1960. It's that time again where every four years, America gears up to elect its next president. Candidate Richard Nixon and his opponent, John F. Kennedy, will be participating in common practice prior to the election the first of a chain of debates. What appears as normal practice will actually change politics forever. Today is the first ever televised political debate. Now, a determined Ronald Reagan, oh no, Richard Nixon, <laughs> has been campaigning until hours before the debate and has actually left his hospital stay early. Now he shows up to the debate appearing emaciated and pale, to the point where his mother phoned him the following day to ask him if he was sick. Anyway, the debate carried on as normal, and there is still controversy as to who won. This is where things get interesting. Those who heard the debate over the radio claimed that Nixon won, while those who saw the televised version, where Kennedy appeared tan, well-groomed, and suave, claimed that Kennedy won. After the debate, Kennedy's rating in the presidential race surpassed Nixon's, and Kennedy later went on to secure the presidential nomination. Now what we learned from this is the power of appearance. Not many people remember the actual promises of the candidates, but they do remember what they looked like. And in the end, it made all the difference. After this, debates were frequently, if not always, televised, and understanding the power of appearance, candidates sought to put their images on as many television, computer, and phone screens as possible. But many candidates do not have the financial means to conduct an effective campaign by themselves, so they turn to corporations who can provide the funding. Unfortunately, corporations are choosy as to who they give their money to and will support exclusively candidates who will support them in return with things like tax cuts and the freedom to do, a, the freedom to do what they like. So in this sense, corporations are able to control which candidates have the means to assume presidency and which laws will eventually govern the economy. So, when we first brought in mass publicity to campaigns, we lacked foresight, thinking that politics would merely become an entertaining spectacle for the whole public. What we've really done is given large organizations a political power stronger than any vote you could ever cast. I know that was a bit uh, heavy, but I'm not trying to paint modern communication as a force of evil or the trigger of mankind's demise. 
Communication is a tool, and an incredibly powerful one at that. It enables the user to consolidate power by moving things, be it money or influence. The same applies regarding the general public, but we, do, we use it to move people. And our power to mobilize our peers is our greatest ally in a world where our presences are microscopic when confronting a large organization. What I'm talking about is revolutions. Let's go back to the 18th century. 18th century. America is fighting the British for its independence, and rumor has it that they're actually doing pretty well for themselves. News travels to other countries at cumbersome boat speed, and soon enough, countries from Europe and South America receive rumors that an unjust tyranny is being successfully fought off by a bunch of stubbly patriots. Now, years later, these countries, indignant towards their own monarchies and armed with new enlightenment ideals like power to the people, begin to rebel against their own unjust conditions in what was known as the Atlantic Revolutions. Now, a few of these countries succeeded in their overthrows, but many failed to change the system. But it's okay. Change will come soon enough. The first revolutionary wave has slowly washed upon the shore. So what is a revolutionary wave? Well, it's simple. One country begins to eradicate societal defects from the inside, and soon enough its neighbors are inspired to do the same thing. Now, remember those countries of the Atlantic revolutions? You may recall their positions in Europe and South America places where Americans could easily and frequently sail. This brings up a key point. Revolutionary waves can only spread to countries who can effectively communicate with one another. Imagine the Atlantic Ocean as a big blue internet forum. So what happens when you can communicate with the whole continent? Well, in 1905, Iran, concerned with changing its constitution, sparked the constitutional revolutions, which shook the whole Asian continent into amending the principles that each of the countries were founded on. With a brand spanking new telegraph machine operating at what we used to consider lightning speed, urges to reform shot around all of Asia, reaching as far as Russia and Japan. Only this time, the wave forms in a matter of months. So, as we've observed in history, the speed and distance in which we can communicate can make the difference between a singular and a worldwide shedding of political skin. Previously, revolutionary waves could only spread to where boats could sail. Then, with the invention of the telegraph and the modern use of railways, these waves could wash through land masses as big as Russia or Europe. I mean, Europe or Asia. But nowadays, we live in a world where we can send a message 40,000 kilometers around the world with the tap of a finger. So what does that mean? Well, we can easily observe the implications. We turn on the TV and are immediately shown clips of mass protesters, tear gas, Students waving signs and demanding a better world at the top of their voices. And this isn't happening in one place, this is happening everywhere. In the past, an inability for the public to organize made them unresponsive when, coming, when it comes to such defects in society. But today, the public is anything but. The Arab Spring, the Thailand protests, and the Euro Maiden movement in Ukraine, to name a few, have all started from social media venues like Twitter and Facebook, from SMS and email. Is one picture. <laughs> so, modern communication has formed a world which is changing every day. With the way large organizations are able to assume more power versus the way that the public is able to quickly respond and extinguish their rule, the way empires rise and fall happens much faster. This growth and decay cycle of the ruling class goes around a hundred times normal speed. My project. So going to green school, we are often put under the pressure of being deemed the architects of a better future and are often referred to as green leaders. So in the beginning of the year, in a beautiful time where greenstone procrastination was an acceptable thing, I decided, I decided my project would be an inquisition into the concept of utopia or a perfect world. How could it exist? Could it even exist? Um, I studied a lot of governments and read a lot of books, but came back shorthanded upon finding that it was not foreseeable or realistic that the term utopia actually meant an imaginary ideal society. So for a disappointed month, I spent most of my Greenstone study sessions surfing through YouTube. <laughs> Thomas Hobbes actually wrote in a book outlining a fictional utopian society that there are many things 
in the commonwealth of utopia that I rather wish than hope to see, meaning that although it is a beautiful concept, don't hold your breath waiting for it. So, in the middle of my stupor of viral videos, I realized that my research was not actually in vain, that my research was in fact applicable in the opposite direction, or dystopia. A perfect world. How could it exist? Could it even exist? Um, I studied a lot of governments and read a lot of books, but came back shorthanded upon finding that it was not foreseeable or realistic, that the term utopia actually meant an imaginary ideal society. So for a disappointed month, I spent most of my Greenstone study sessions surfing through YouTube. <laughs> Thomas Hobbes actually wrote in a book outlining a fictional utopian society that there are many things in the commonwealth of utopia that I rather wish than hope to see, meaning that although it is a beautiful concept, don't hold your breath waiting for it. So, in the middle of my stupor of viral videos, I realized that my research was not actually in vain, that my research was in fact applicable in the opposite direction, or dystopia, a society characterized by human misery. And the interesting thing about dystopia is that it's ten times more real than utopia. We live in a world filled with genocide, political indifference to the sick and the poor, big business being able to operate politics. An interesting thing about dystopia is that it's ten times more real than utopia. We live in a world filled with genocide, political indifference to the sick and the poor, big business being able to operate politics. So, aware of the wide-found dissolution in society, my Greenstone moved into the field of why. I found my answer in parks and streets scattered around the globe. Protests, revolutions, Occupy movements. I wish I could have gone more in depth with these things, but they all pointed to the same thing. People circumventing their defective democracies through voice and fist. So, as shown in history, the speed and prevalence of technology and communication has yielded an increase in the speed of social evolution as well. When we can send our thoughts faster, action happens as well. Action happens faster as well. That being said, we live in the most dynamic and rapidly changing times of human existence so far. So, understanding this, we need to take advantage of this powerful new weapon and use these new tools to fix problems rather than photograph our food. Assert the voice of the people rather than idly scroll through Facebook. Empower rather than poke. <laughs> a lot of philosophers may have condemned the idea of utopia as impossible, but then again, they've never really lived in a time like this. Thank you. In the moment.